Hello and welcome to the Diabetes Army Rebuild podcast. My name is Dan. Uh, recovering type 2 diabetic put my diabetes in remission and um, created this platform to try to make some awareness happen and to spread the good word on uh, the positivity of type 2 diabetes and more importantly get some real science out to people not bro science some real science so um, I was on over 7,000 units of insulin a month and currently insulin free I've got my type 2 diabetes in remission and, and uh, I want you to do the same. So this is where we're at. This is where we're going. And uh, this is my podcast to, to uh, again, try to get you thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, about type 2 diabetes. Perhaps your diabetes might be your parents, your grandparents. Um, you know, who knows? But uh, if we can get some awareness happening, that would be fantastic in my book. So this week, I'm going to talk about uh, great studies that I found. Um, this is on sleep duration and the risk of type 2 diabetes so I uh, own a wellness company in my wellness company we have four pillars right we have number one mindset number two is nutrition number three uh, is exercise and number four sleep and rest and they're all as important as the others so uh, when it comes to sleep and rest it's something that I personally work on a lot and um, you know it's something that's uh, that's really played out in my my uh, role with uh, type 2 diabetes we're going to talk about my sleep habits after I run through this study and see if you can pick anything out of this that might help you or a family member um, as far as their uh, sleep goes so um, let's get into it <clears throat> so um, it, uh, the study says that, uh, you know, they, they did this because it was unclear uh, how many hours of sleep uh, are associated with the lowest uh, risk of type 2 diabetes. The meta-analysis was performed to assess the dose-response relationship between sleep duration and type 2 diabetes. In other words, how long you sleep if it plays out at all with your type 2 diabetes. So sort of interesting, and again, it gets back to the four pillars that I talk about uh, in my wellness company. The, Un the Unity Wellness Group. So let's talk about this. So the research uh, was done from PubMed and Embase, and they uh, searched up to the 20th of March 2014 forward, okay? So uh, during this, they assessed the relationship of uh, risk of type 2 diabetes. So this is, this is what plays into if you're not getting enough sleep, what is the risk factor of you, you know, becoming a type 2 diabetic, which is really interesting. So 10 articles with 11 reports were eligible um, for inclusion in this study, a uh, total of uh, 18,443 uh, incident cases uh, of type 2 diabetes uh, were involved with 482,502 uh, participants. So that's a lot, a lot of people. So it sounds like a pretty thorough study if you ask me, right? Um, so they wanted to find out what's the sleep duration that's gonna have the lowest risk uh, for type two diabetes. Uh, the study was uh, follow-up periods in this were from two and a half to 16 years. Now that's a long time to do any kind of a follow-up follow-up uh, in any sort of a study. It's, uh, I often see these anywhere from three to five years. So we're talking two and a half to 16 years. So this was a great, great job on trying to put this together. So what they found um, to summarize this, <clears throat> excuse me, is they observed the ideal sweet spot for sleep is seven to eight hours. Once again, the ideal sleep spot uh, sweet spot for sleep is seven to eight hours. So if you're getting the seven to eight hours, uh, you're doing well. And the risks multiplied for every hour you slept less than that. So for example, if you slept six hours, five hours, four hours, and there's a lot of people that go around, they say, hey, you know, I don't need a lot of sleep. I can get by on four hours. Well, are you kidding yourself? I mean, do you have any stats that, that show this? And then we're gonna talk about something else about sleep as, as we go along with this. So um, conclusion, our uh, dose response meta-analysis uh, show that uh, the sweet spot for, for type two diabetes risk <clears throat> is seven to eight hours sleep per night and again this study was done from two and a half years to 16 years so if you're getting less than the seven eight hours of sleep it's something that perhaps you should take a look at and maybe do some work with so um, 
what I wanted to also bring into this is the fact that I wear a CGM, I wear a Dexcom, and in full disclosure, I'm a spokesman for Dexcom. But what's great about the Dexcom CGM is I watch my um, uh, blood sugar numbers, right? My, my glucose numbers constantly, and I see what affects them. And it's not just food. Many people think it's just food that, that really plays havoc on their numbers, and it's not the case. Stress, I tell people all the time, when you come out of a stressful meeting, take a look at your CGM, whether it be a Dexcom or something else, and, and see what your uh, numbers look like, right? So you've got that happening. But another one is sleep. <clears throat> Look at your morning number when you've had a short sleep. So for example, if you had a busy business day or you're out with your friends uh, maybe later than normal, you picked up five hours of sleep. Look and see what your morning number is and I'm almost willing to bet it's going to be higher. It'll come down during the day, but I'm almost willing to bet it's going to be higher uh, with that sleep deprivation. So um, sleep, sleep is so, so important and we've talked about sleep before uh, on this podcast. So I'm going to run through my protocols for sleep in the evening and, and how I get ready because I really don't sleep a lot and I'm up a couple of times during the night. Uh, I travel a lot. I'm actually recording this up in Edmonton, Canada. I'll be back in Los Angeles uh, recording next week. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I'm sleeping in different beds. I, I generally rent an Airbnb um, while I'm up here for a month at a time. Uh, I'm here on business. But um, I, I actually have moved Airbnbs to find a better bed so I can get more uh, sleep in. I try to get seven hours sleep. I'm not always successful. Often it's six and a half. Last night uh, I got six hours and 50 minutes, so very close to seven. Um, and I notice a big difference in how I feel the next day with energy and things like that. I'm working out a lot, so how much energy do I have in the gym? But I've also upped my step count. So I notice the nights after I have a great night's sleep, it's a lot easier. I have a lot more energy to go out and walk those steps than I do on the nights I don't have it. So some things I do uh, at my place, uh, for better sleep. I've started, uh, before I go to bed, taking a warm shower. I shower every morning. However, I've started taking a warm shower at night, and I find this really helps me. It really, you know, calms me down and and, uh, and just kind of soothes me. So I take a warm shower at night. Uh, I take uh, magnesium. I take, uh, what other supplements do I take? I t inositol, and I take, it's basically Andrew Huberman's sleep stack, and I've had many conversations with uh, Andrew. Andrew, I'm lucky enough to know him, uh, you know, about, about a sleep stack and, and things that are happening. You can always Google uh, Huberman Lab uh, sleep stack if you want to see what his are. They discovered these in his lab in Stanford. He, uh, he has the Huberman Lab podcast and uh, a wonderful podcast. And he's done deep dives on sleep. He had Dr. Matt Walker on. I'm pretty sure he's a doctor. Um, uh, Matthew Walker, uh, he wrote the book Why We Sleep. Really interesting book if you're into sleep. Uh, what else do I do? I get the light lower uh, as I uh, head into the, the, the later hours of the evening. When I get home, I like to exercise my mind. I do mind puzzles and things like that in the evening just to chill out. I don't do those too close to bedtime though. I don't want my my brain in a, in a, in a critical stage of, of problem solving before I go to bed. Often I'll read, uh, I, I have a Kindle, I'll read something that's lighthearted or, or something along these lines just to, uh, you know, again, kind of relax me and, and stuff like that. I keep my uh, place here. In LA, I live at the beach. So I've got the ocean breezes on my uh, my house. Matter of fact, I often have to close my windows at night. I don't even have air conditioning in my house. But if I crack my window a bit, it's going to cool my room down. And up here, I do the same thing. Uh, I have the air conditioning on and I keep having to turn it down at night. As a matter of fact, it's kind of funny. If I get up to use the restroom, the air conditioning in this uh, Airbnb is set to be at a certain temperature. And and um, it's too warm for me, so I keep fighting with it and bringing it down so I sleep better in a cooler room. You want the room a couple of degrees cooler, right? Because your body needs to cool down when it sleeps. That's why we lay down, because it's easier for your body to dissipate the, the heat in it, right, as opposed to sleeping in a chair. So uh, we want the room a little bit cooler at night when we go to bed, and uh, I make sure that that's happening. Uh, what other things do I do? 
I make sure the room is dark. I've got blackout curtains on the windows in the, the Airbnb I have here, blackout curtains. I also invest in a good bed. In Los Angeles at my house, I've got a great bed. Um, I have a sleep number bed. Um, I love it. It adjusts my sleep through the evening and I can, or through the night and I can adjust to exactly what my sleep number might be as far as the comfort of the bed goes and I find out where I sleep best. I track all my sleep on my Apple Watch. I have a couple of different apps that I track with it. I want to see how much really deep sleep, how much REM sleep, and um, and how settled I was through the night. And if I wasn't too settled, do I need to change anything to sleep the next night? I don't eat for a couple of hours before I go to bed, um, so I'm I'm you know I'm not having a late dinner and then going and, and crashing. So uh, alcohol and sleep. Uh, I I'm I rarely have a drink anymore. I spent 12 years on a pro wrestling tour, so you can imagine what I've seen and done. Um, at this point in my life, I'm the kind of the opposite. So I'm really into my health, and I'm trying to get healthier. But uh, yeah, um, alcohol is not great for sleep. You think, well, yeah, but I'll pass out and have a great night's sleep. No, you won't get into that real deep sleep that your body needs to heal. And that's what your body's doing. Right? You know, it's like this podcast, Diabetes Army Rebuild. Your body needs to heal as you continue to go through your sleep stages. So, you know, these are just things that I do. Um, you see the study, what it says, sweet spot, seven, eight hours. And uh, this is what we aim to get. So there's the uh, facts, folks. 400,000 people, um, I think, is probably pretty thorough. And, um, and you can use that and see if you can pull anything out of it. So my name is Dan. You can follow me on all the social media platforms. Um, Diabetes Army everywhere. It's uh, Instagram, uh, uh, YouTube. Obviously, my podcast, Diabetes Army Rebuild, TikTok. I do a lot of live streaming on TikTok. I post a lot of stuff on Instagram. So, uh, And if you have a question or something, feel free to leave a comment here. I, I try to answer everybody back. And um, there you have it. So doing a lot of traveling. So what we've had, a, we missed last week, but I'm back on this week and I'm super excited to bring this to you. And I hope this helps. Please spread the word for someone who might need the help. So uh, let's make reversing type two diabetes cool. My name is Dan. This is Diabetes Army Rebuild. And thank you again for watching.